Russia originally. My dad was the reason that we immigrated to the States. He always wanted a better life for his family and for me, and he worked really hard to make that happen. And so we moved uh, to the States in 1991, and um, I recall just my childhood was pretty, so we, we moved like four or five times because my mom was a doctor, and so we were moving around for her placements. I grew up with a lot of change, like a lot of unpredictability, like unpredictability um, of moods, and I could rely on my dad to be con constant, like he was the constant in my life. And when my parents divorced at eight years old, he continued to be the constant in my life. And he was such a presence. Um, when I left for Russia for a year and a half with my mom, he called me every day. He just really made sure to re that I knew that I was loved, that I was remembered, that I was seen, heard. Um, so he, he was a really um, stable force in my life. He was also, I really admired him. He never spoke bad about anyone. Like, I literally never heard him say one thing about anyone that was talking behind their back or putting them down in any way. Even when my parents divorced, he never said one bad thing about my mom. Mm -hmm. And it was um, just, I really admired him. I really admired the way that he was a friend and that he always showed up to be helpful for his friends. He would always drop up off something like a, he listened to some CD and he thought someone else would like that music, he would drop it off and put it in their mailbox. So he's just like a, a man of service and I really looked up to him and he's also very much the one that was always checking in on education with me and like where I'm at with school and really kind of helping me along both financially and in a, in a way of guiding me to get my higher education. I come from a family that really values higher education and my mom's side of the family are all MD, PhDs, and my dad's side are all um, engineers and <clears throat> mathem mathematicians and software engineers. And so, you know, he was always like, okay, like, what are you going to get your higher education? And really stewarded me into going towards clinical counseling and psychotherapy. And I was always interested in psychology and just human behavior just because I was so interested in kind of the behavior that was happening in my family. <laughs> and uh, when I was applying for my uh, program, uh, which my dad f and had helped me kind of find the exact program that was right for me, it was during that process that he suddenly passed away. Mm -hmm. And so it was such a, you know, it was such a, um, such a sudden thing that happened at his death that it was, it's hard to describe, it's just like, it was out of nowhere, like this man that, you know, played tennis every morning before work, was super active, super charismatic, like, you know, active, basically, to just die like that. And um, your question was, how did he impact me? So, <clears throat> what had happened was that, another way that I really admired my dad was, he really, really cared for my grandparents a lot. He'd call my grandmother every single day. My dad has a brother who has special needs. He has um, a chronic mental health condition, and he checked up on him every single day. He would drive really far distances to just be with his parents to help them out and to help his brother. He would drive to see me. So just like consistently um, care being there for his family, like really, really strong family man, um, in addition to working and all the rest. And when I went, right before he passed away, like a few like phone calls before that, he said to me something that still sticks with me to this day, and I don't, didn't really understand like where it was coming from, it was just kind of a random thing he was saying to me was, Julia, remember, you're never alone. And he just always wanted me to remember that I, he was there, that I was never alone, and then the last phone call we had, he had said that, and then he died a week later. And so that, you know, is very, is, is kind of, to, to receive that information, you're never alone, and then boom, to actually be left, quote unquote, alone in the physical plane was an intense experience. And I have to say, 
I was at going through a spiritual journey. I've been going through a spiritual journey. My, you know, since 13, my mom's kind of exposed me to the spiritual path, uh, Eastern philosophy, and I just happened to be at a spiritual retreat when he passed away. And we were learning about the Bardo Todal. We were learning about what happens after death, that death is an illusion, all these things that we were learning. And here I am, like, it's happening to me. And so now I have to take... You know, I'm taking this stuff that I was kind of processing intellectually, these this, these ideas, this really like, just hypothetical ideas for me at the time of what death might be or might not be. And here I am experiencing it at the very same spiritual workshop that we're learning about how death is an illusion. And so my experience of my dad's death was nothing short of one of the most mystical experiences in my life. Um, when he said that I'm never alone, like he continued to really make sure that I did not feel alone. I had a very mystical experience during his death with hearing him, feeling him, being guided by him, um, and which was very, very intense for the first, I would say, 30 days since after his, di- his death. My grief really kicked in, I would say, like three years later because for the first for the fir- when he first passed away, I felt his spirit so strongly that I almost didn't feel a loss. Like, I, I, I just felt his guidance, and all these synchronicities were happening. Like, I was just being guided where I needed to go, and I felt him guiding me. I would meet the right people. I would I discovered dance therapy, and that's really, you know, his his death guided me to, to what I now might is my dharma to this world, which is showing how embodiment can be an incredible way to process grief and any emotional, any emotions, anything challenging in life, dancing through it is really helpful for our our human form Um, because we store so much in our bodies and so much trauma in our bodies and when we dance it allows that energy to move through us, it allows us to express that which is hard to put into words. So when he died, although I didn't feel a loss, I definitely felt a lot of feelings. And I felt a loss. I just, I just, grief is such a thing, and it's not a, a linear thing. So I, it's just come in waves. I, when he first passed away, I had a lot of emotion passing through me. Um, and I found that dance was the best way for me to, to, to process it all. Like, I couldn't really understand what I was, everything I was processing. Um, it also allowed me to process just some of the stuff that I'd been holding back from my childhood, too. Just some of the ways that I wasn't allowing myself to express. Mm-hmm. And so, he, he, that's how he impacted me. He allowed me to get in touch with, like, some of my deepest feelings and find, find a modality that really, really served me. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm just sniffly. (laughs) No, it's okay. I mean, so when he, the way that he also, what I I say is that my dad, like I said, I was on a spiritual journey learning about, you know, the idea of like everything, you know, that we create our reality, that things are a mirror, that we create with our thoughts and that we, some things are an illusion, you know, it looks like we're separate, but we're really, we're really not separate. We're really connected much more than we that what meets the eye and he his passing really allowed me to fully get that Um, both by the mystical experiences that I was having but also just the synchronicities that kept happening like for example after I discovered that I that dance was a modality that I wanted to pursue because you know I had been applying for these clinical programs traditional psychotherapy and here I am at this dance class that I discovered at Kripalu which was the most cathartic thing I'd ever done. And in that moment of that one hour class, I thought to myself, wow, this is healing. Like, what is this? You know, I just, I was blown away by the amount that I processed in an hour. It felt like 10 years of therapy in one hour. And so I approached the teacher right then and there and said it was a journey dance is the, is the, what the class was and Tony Bergens is the founder. I I pushed Tony and I remember just being like, what is this Tony? She's like, well, I'm having a teacher training like in two weeks. And I signed up for the teacher training after one hour of that class. Like I just had to have one hour of it and I signed up. It was just clear to me. So I started to, 
uh, become you know trained in this journey dance methodology and hustling teaching journey dance in New York which at the time embodiment mindfulness like what people didn't understand the correlation of why someone would engage in movement for healing like that just it wasn't as prevalent then there's now all this research about somatic work and the importance of how trauma is stored in the body and now yoga is a lot more you know it's everyone understands it through yoga also like oh they feel better when they breathe into their body so yoga's really helped but back then in 2010 it wasn't really that prevalent so I was really feeling like I had to hustle and push this so when I discovered that there was a uh, a field of dance movement therapy that's an actual field in psychotherapy that uses dance movement and studies the scientific way that movement heals emotions and that how emotions and movement in the body are correlated and not to mention how you know spirit also is all correlated with the body it's like wow okay all right this is a thing I'm like this is an actual established career path and that was the way that I discovered that was a complete synchronicity like I just happened to see flyer somewhere and then when I got into the uh, subway on the second day of the three-day conference it was a packed subway in New York City you know you can imagine on a Saturday and I'm like literally like this and then 42nd Street Times Square everyone gets off one spot opens up I sit down and what are the chances this woman next to me as I open the brochure for the dance therapy conference tells me she's going there as well and starts just chatting chatting away really like inspired that I'm going, she's a lot older, she's already a dance therapist, and she's like, you must, you must go to Leslie in Boston. You must go to Boston. <laughs> My dad was from Boston, and I was living in New York, and I was like, listen, I, okay, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into it, like, there's some New York schools, and she just kept pushing Boston. She's like, no, you really gotta go there, I'll mentor you, I know the woman that runs the dance therapy program, I'll connect you to her, like, just really, and, Right before we our stop to get off in Brooklyn for the camp conference, she hands me her card and she says, hey, listen, like it's a big conference. I might not see you again, but please reach out to me when you come to when you come to Boston to our program at Leslie. And I looked at the card and literally my heart nearly skipped a beat. It said her name and then it said social worker and the name of where she worked, which is uh, Burlington Clinic, Leahy Burlington Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts. We're in New York City, and that's the exact hospital that my dad passed away in. So these, that's when I was like, okay, dad, I'm going to Boston. And it's those moments that I kept feeling him guiding me. And it's like, you can't deny that stuff. Like, was that a coincidence? I mean, sure, if you want to call it that, but it's really, that for that to happen, and so, he keeps like planting these people in my life so that I really don't feel alone. I really have not been feeling alone. And it's like, this, the, I, I, what I've realized is also like, since he passed away, the universe has become my surrogate parent. And I really pay attention. When I'm feeling like I don't know what to do, or I'm just like losing that connection that, or forgetting that I'm, that I'm not, that I'm really not alone and, and feeling alone or feeling that grief, I just go out to nature. I go out and I just, I'm like, Dad, please, like, I remind me, you know, and I dance with nature, and sure enough, like, another synchronicity will happen. A song of his will play that we listen to together. Something, and that's what kept me going. It's like really paying attention to the little signs of his presence and really paying attention to the, the, the people that have been sent my way and the places that I've been and just really like wow like thank you for still being there thank you for still taking care of me in some ways and even in a greater capacity to take care of me because now he's like you know he does not bound by the physical limitations and he's just been supporting me like in, immensely um, one last example I'll give is when I was like uh, Mexico and I was had a really interesting situation I was
called out there to be a part of this big festival that ended up falling through, and they had promised me housing that what fell through. It was New Year's there in December. In Tulum is, if you've ever been to Tulum New Year's, it is packed. Like there's, it's all sold, everything's sold out. So I couldn't find anywhere to live. And I was like in this hostel, like holding all my belongings, like scared, just like not, not really in the safest place. And <clears throat> to like basically a day later, long story short, I get into this cab of sharing a cab with someone that was also hailing a cab. On New Year's there was like, we had to share a cab because there was so little, not many of them. And um, I started, you know, to, we chatted, I shared that I was there and my situation, that I was stuck, I didn't have anywhere to stay. And he goes, oh, well, I have a condo here and I'm leaving tomorrow. You can stay there. I'll just give you the keys and you can stay there all month. And it's like, what? And then it's like, in those moments, I'm like, dad. It's like, totally dad, like, not letting his daughter be homeless in Mexico. <laughs> um, and so I had this condo, you know? So it's just, it's just, you gotta pay attention to these things in order to continue to have that strength and hope and to keep going. You gotta really see that things are, as hard as it might sound, they happen for a reason, and that you, because of his passing, I have now been able to help so many people overcome grief, mental health issues, um, because I really experienced it firsthand and found these really unique ways of... Yeah, I'm seriously moved by the, the, the supernatural um, reality that we're all connected, whether they're here on this plane or in another plane. I find it very fascinating that your dad has always been your constant, your rock, and I feel like that is the divine masculine energy, mm. is to be the grounding, and the divine feminine is the water. Yeah. ever changing ever moving yes so in a way the divine feminine is chaotic the unknown right but we're we're amorphous and yet we're like almost like chameleons like we could shape shift and then the divine masculine is constantly <clears throat> I would say looking after um, I guess I'm I'm tearing up because it like it's so beautiful <laughs> just like the whole dynamic that you have a very strong father that's made such a difference for you. For, for three years, you still felt his presence, but there was, I sense that there was still a, maybe a wall or some kind of protective layer, maybe it's the ego, that, that um, wasn't ready to soften and... Um, go inwards through that that void experience yeah. of, of crying and feeling lost or soft. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think were some of the supernatural clues or maybe what incidences triggered the beginning of your grieving going inward and actually crying and um, were, were you ever at that point where you felt lost mm -hmm. um, during the grieving process mm -hmm. and what was that like? Yeah, sure. Well, I just want to clarify, I definitely cried, you know, especially when I would dance is when I would cry, but a lot of my tears were tears of, in the beginning, were tears of like, wow, like I'm still hearing you, you're still, we're still connected, like they were tears of like, like, awakening like they were tears of 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 this like it wasn't tears of loss it was tears of awe that's what i would say um but then of course if there were things that were challenging because there were things that were happening with my mom um throughout this time that were really 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 challenging and a lot of the tears would be grief around it that grief around <clears throat> a person that I love and would want so much 
happiness and health for having such a difficult time. That's really the grief that I was experiencing the first, because it's like, it was a loss. It was like I was losing, it's like I lost my mother. And, um, and that, through the dance, I was, uh, I was able to really feel a lot of that, that anger and grief for someone that was still alive. Like, I feel like that is a really important to, to mention. It's like, we can feel grief about about relationships that where the person hasn't you know left this form but it might be grieving a, a loss of, of a role that they were meant to play or um, a loss of them being able to show up for you or the, the shifting of a relationship um, so that's the grief I, I would say that I experienced most of um, for the first yeah I would say two three years and the shift from my dad is like, I actually was again at a journey dance workshop. This, it's a very powerful modality and I encourage everyone to look it up at journeydance.com. It um, was at this workshop that I had this epiphany, because I, th I think you're right, it was a protective thing. Um, in addition to like truly all these synchronicities happening, for sure my heart was just, you know, it was there was a there was a part of it that I wasn't fully accessing where that pain or that void as you're saying was and it was during I remember I was at this workshop and I don't exactly remember what happened there but I just remember having the epiphany of like oh my gosh I haven't actually grieved it's been three years and I have never actually felt the loss because I still feel him so strongly um, and because he was able to, because I was able to communicate with him in these ways and also um, I just have a very strong spiritual practice that helped me. So um, I just had an epiphany, that's all I could say. It was like, oh my gosh, I have not actually grieved. And that was it, it was just this moment. and. And it was through the dance again that then I just began. It was, I, and for me, you know, when I went to Boston, I took care of my grandparents and being with them through their last stages of life and seeing them decline and placing them in a nursing home and being their primary caregiver, that, that like brought up a lot of like, dad, like, where are you, you know? And um, what would you want me to do in this situation? like? I'm this like 20 something year old making these literally end of life decisions for my grandparents and not knowing exactly how to be or what to do and and that they did find that our program impacted just once a week the kids were coming. So this is one of like the the testimonials that I got from the kids. I learned that service takes my mind off of dark thoughts self-hate and cravings for drugs. Plant Pals, which is what the program was called originally, makes me feel good about me, and I enjoy Gina and Julia. <laughs> so it's really remarkable, the impact, not just that work, work like, with like, seeing seniors, it's just service in general. You know, when in doubt, think out. When we are of service, we actually become to play big and feel our bigness and see ourselves in these roles that are not what we identify with sometimes, like these kids in addiction and recovery, they're constantly reflecting on themselves as bad, as there's something that's wrong with them, and here they are in a place where they're actually doing something and being a leader, being compassionate, being kind, and getting, seeing them, witnessing themselves in that state. Like everyone, just for a moment, just get into a position of what you might feel like sitting in a wheelchair or having some kind of disability feels like, just for a moment, and just notice it doesn't take that long. Now imagine sitting like that for hours, for weeks, for months, maybe even years, without any stimulation. And this is what we do, and we like just continue to make ourselves stiffer and stiffer by stifling play. And I love this quote, we don't stop playing because we grow old, we grow old because we stop playing. I like to substitute dance in there. And it would come through when I would beach dance. <laughs> I would go beach dancing, and that's when I would feel most connected to my dad. Like that practice to me, there's something about being in the elements and the movement. Um, and I, w I would literally just have these like 
moments of of like releasing whatever was blocking my connection and like finally feeling connected or just like praying like without it like without actually getting guidance but just like praying that was the way I prayed that's the way I asked for support it's the way I gave gratitude it's the way that I ex cried and grieved when I needed to just release I would go to the beach and I would dance put on my headphones put on a uh, shuffle oracle I called it something that I learned from another teacher of mine Rochelle Sheik of Koya which is another movement modality that I studied and um, she taught us this oracle shuffle and you place your your phone on you know iPhone your your music on shuffle and you trust that the three songs that are gonna come on are the perfect songs for you and I and I did and I would trust those three songs and it was always what I needed to hear and I sometimes felt like I don't know maybe I'm this was just a way that I coped but I felt like it was my dad sharing a message with me that I needed to hear at times or guiding me through the lyrics or the melody um, there were certain songs that specifically like bridge over troubled water that really spoke to me. Um, it's a song that played on the day of his death and then kept playing at different times. Like I ran a 10K um, in his memory um, for his one year and as I crossed the finish line, Bridge Over Troubled Water came on. Like, you know, things like that. And so I was just, I've always just trusted that and I think, you know, your beliefs create your reality. So maybe it's because I believe so strongly in this, it continues to happen for me that these synchronicities come through in the forms of songs, in the forms of um, nature, in the forms of um, people and, you know, um, opportunities. Um, and so dance was the way that I connected to him. And dance was also the way where I really let myself go. Like I could just let myself go. I would drop down to my knees and just, you know, surrender. Like, I don't, like, I don't know what to do, help. And Usually after those moments of letting that emotion pass through me, that's what's so important. I, as a dance therapist, I also really like guide people to understand that emotion is energy in motion and we, it needs to move. And if it, you just hold it all in and hold it all in and like pretend like it's not there, it's, that's, it's still there. <laughs> and moving through it can be easier sometimes than talking about something. And in our work, I, I got my master's in dance therapy, but that was my specialization under the umbrella of expressive arts therapy. And expressive arts therapy is art therapy, music therapy, drama therapy, and dance therapy. And so I learned how to express some of the most challenging feelings inside through cre in creative ways, through the arts. So in addition to dancing something out, you can also create art around grief. And then you can look at it and really be with it here, like your heart. You know, you could do a whole heart map. Like, what are you feeling in your heart? There might be a part that's completely broken. And there might be a little part that still has hope. And there might be a part that's like fully in love and grateful and with, to life. But there's like, it's just honoring that there's a lot happening. It's not just one thing. And yes, there's a part that has grief and there's also a part that has hope. And there's also a part that's angry. And there's also a part that's irritable and there's also a part that's like super loving and compassionate and just like like really allowing yourself to see that in a visual form um it's like oh okay like you get to know yourself better and you also allow some of that energy that's stuck inside to come out and be expressed through the art wow. so that's also something that helped me through this process a lot of art therapy in, in addition to dance therapy yeah <laughs> I could feel it. I could. I could feel the um, the different paths you've gone through in your journey. Um, so, how did the movement start building? Now you have like 40, 50 people. We actually had eighty. Awesome. Eighty people that joined us. Tell us the evolution, like yeah. how, from the beginning when it was just you to where it is today. Sure. Could you tell us that journey? For sure. Thanks. So as I mentioned, beach dancing is something that I went to as a self-care practice when I was feeling really times that I needed clarity and guidance and also in times where I um, was going to visit my grandparents at the nursing home in order for me to just 
really be present with them. I would go and dance away whatever else was going on and then go to the nursing home so that I could really be present. Um, or I would go to the nursing home, see the situation there, which was a lot of neglected individuals, and then leave being like, wow, that was really hard, and then dance that out. Um, so <clears throat> I used it in both ways to clear space and be, and to, I mean, each time it clears space. But needless to say, I could always rely on beach dancing. It was always there for me. I just had to dance. <laughs> and listen, if it's not on the beach, just anywhere in nature. But I was lucky that there was a beach next to my grandparents' nursing home, so I was going to the beach. And I continued to do this for eight years I've been beach dancing, like consistently. And I also do these labyrinths on the beach that I also learned through Koya. And it's just a way of, it's like a walking meditation and you can ask a question or ask for clarity and you just draw a spiral in the sand and you walk. And then when you get to the center, you just take a moment there, a few moments, and you just wait kind of to to feel if any clarity comes through or any answers about your question and you usually there are and then you walk out and I'm like wow like you just you, the answers are really are within and there's these, these tools that you can use to access them so for me it was these labyrinths on the beach the art therapy and the beach dancing and so when I moved to Venice I was beach dancing quite a lot because I lived down the street from the beach and when my friends would, you know, want to hang out with me, I'd let them know I was going beach dancing and they could come and join me if they wanted. And several of them did. And just witnessing them dance is was so beautiful. To witness another just fully self-expressed, letting go of any constriction or feelings of, like, anyone's watching me, like, just letting themselves be. It was such a beautiful thing for me to experience. And then they reflected back to me that it was a profound experience for them. Like it seems simple, like, oh, I'm going to dance on the beach. It's different than dancing anywhere else. There's something that happens that makes it a spiritual experience and you get to connect to yourself in a way that it's, it's hard. It's also hard for some people to sit still in meditation and this is like a moving meditation. And so, they began to join me and one of my friends, April, just was like, Julia, you really should do this for, you know, for the community. And I at the time laughed. I was like, what are you talking about? You know, this is just a self-care practice. And she's like, no, really, like, this is awesome. Like, this is something really special. Like, do it. And so with her support, I was like, okay. So I put on Instagram. <laughs> just so I announced on Instagram, I'll be, I remember it was Thursday at 9 a.m. I'll be at this part of the beach. You want to come join me? And I made it by donation. And I thought to myself, you know what? This will be some something that the donations will go towards a nonprofit that I had started about visiting the seniors in nursing homes. Alma. Alma. Yes. So I started this um, nonprofit called Alma, addressing loneliness through movement and arts. It was inspired by placing my grandparents in the nursing home, seeing how neglected and that population is, and really wanting to do something about it and realizing that dance and art and music can be the, what we can bring to these individuals and connect with them despite their physical or cognitive limitations. And so I decided I was going to do this by donation, beach dance, on, and uh, have the donations go towards Alma. And so, you know, I'd have like three to seven people show up for a few weeks, but I just kept showing up. Like, no matter what, I was just there. Um, and then it started to grow and one day one of the participants um, he said you know what I gotta connect you with this guy Murray Hittery of Mind Travel he has these silent scope headsets and I feel like you guys like this could really work here and so he connected me and I shared with Murray what I was up to in the world and shared with him about the nonprofit and he felt really inspired and, and had always again coincidentally wanted to bring his music to nursing homes. He's a pianist and he provides this music that's really healing and he calls it mind travel because it just allows you to kind of, it actually allows you to let your mind go and like to tra let your soul travel. I would call it soul travel. And, um, and he was so inspired and he's like, how many headsets do you need? 
this is one of those other things that I was talking about, like these 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 ways that I'm being helped and guided. That I I really feel like my dad is like <laughs> orchestrating these things. I've also had to learn have had to learn to own my own power because for a long while I was just saying, oh, it's my dad, it's my dad. <laughs> and then I someone once told me they're like, well, don't disempower yourself. You know, yes your dad might be there helping you, but you own the fact that you're also manifesting your reality. And so, while I think that my dad has something to do with it, I also am learning to really trust that, you know. I think when you're on mission uh, and on purpose, the universe conspires in your favor, and you don't need to know how things are gonna happen, you just need to have a strong enough why, and just keep showing up, authentically. And that's what I was doing, I was just showing up consistently. Two years later, I have about 30 to 100 people dancing with me each week. The Wave is a guided community dance experience held in nature that uses a combination of music, dance therapy, and technology to promote belonging, mental well-being, and social responsibility. All attendees are given a set of wireless headphones that are synced to the same music performed by a live DJ who guides the experience via microphone. The Wave is more than just a dance experience. If there's a charity that you want to raise awareness about or raise funds for, the Wave Silent Disco can support whatever it is that you're passionate about. A portion of all proceeds are donated to nonprofits like Alma, which promotes mental health and well-being to our elders. Alma is an organization that's committed to improving the quality of life in nursing homes and assisted living by bringing dignity to our elders' later years. The WAVE also appears at elder communities who can participate in connecting with one another through this therapeutic experience. So these, these headsets got handed to me by spirit. <laughs> and um, I began to now Whereas before, everyone had their own music and we all had our own iPods and we were all doing the Shuffle Oracle kind of individually, but together dancing, but everyone was listening to different things. Then now, it's be like with these headsets, it was, we were able to, I was able to ha have, a, have the playlist that everyone was listening to the same music now and it really felt like a together experience. And as soon as that happened, I realized that, okay, well now I can use my dance therapy <clears throat> background to guide some of this movement to really help people move with intention to like, to just, just with prompts like release what no longer serves you through this dance. What does your heart, dance with your heart for this piece of, for this song. What does it feel, what does your heart want to share with you and just have them go. It's like these simple little cues that allow you to, to dance with intention. Um, to connect with parts of yourself through dance, but by giving yourself that direction in the beginning. So I never tell people how to move or what part of their bodies to move, although I do sometimes have people play with different parts of their body, but there's no choreography. It's just about dancing with intention. And so as soon as I got these headsets, it just blew up. Like, I, Murray's like, how many do you need? I think I said the first one, I was like, I think 10, I need 10 because there was like seven to 10 people coming at the time. And then as soon as I got the headsets, there were like 15 people the next week and then 20. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? I really want to see sunsets. I was doing it in the morning, but I just like wanted to be seeing the sunsets. And so I was like, beach dance is now on sunsets. <laughs> so we moved it to Monday sunsets and um, changed the name from beach Donza. It was called beach Donza to the wave. Um, and we changed the name because I was like, okay, this maybe could be done off the beach. I didn't want to, I didn't want people thinking they had to be on a beach to experience the power of dance, you know. So I called it the wave. And the idea is that when we dance, we create a wave, like a ripple effect mm. of we elevate our vibration and it ripples out into the world. The wave is also because we experience just like waves waves of emotion and to really honor the waves of emotion that are coming up and through your dance it's called the wave because yeah life goes in waves and it's like rather than resisting what is and wanting it to be a different way 
can you just honor that life's a wave? Like life is cyclical. There's we don't get angry at the seasons because they're changing. I mean, sometimes we do, but you know, <laughs> we don't get angry at nature for doing what it does in the fall, losing its leaves, or in the winter, you know, in the East Coast, like the snow falling. Like, it's just that that's nature, and we are cyclical as well. We have to honor those cycles. And grief is a cyclical thing. Nothing. It's not linear. It's not like, oh, you just get over it. No, it goes in waves, right? Our emotion goes in waves. And so that's why it's called the wave. It's like, let's honor our human nature. And let's do that through dance. And by doing that, you actually begin to meet yourself. And in that way, you start to not feel so alone. Because what I've come to realize in this, in this, journey of, of of hearing my dad's voice over and over of, you're not alone it's like what did he really mean by that you know and what I found is when I can connect deeply to myself and nurture myself and take care of myself like I did through the dancing I'm like oh I have I got my own back like I'm not alone because like my higher self and me are like together we like we have each other's back and so that makes me feel like I'm not alone when I'm connecting deeply to me, to my essence. It also makes me feel not alone when I'm connecting to nature. Because then I feel like that I'm connected to something bigger. And nature has a way of soothing us. It's like mother, it's called mother nature for a reason. like ask yourself like when was the last time I was outside when was the last time I had some fresh air when was the last time like you really were present with nature and so to me that is also not feeling alone is when I can actually look up to the sky look out to the trees look look and be with with the ocean and and really use the elements um, in a way that's soothing me like I'm like she she takes care of me like that's so beautiful and then we have like the actual physiological studies that show that being near water makes us happier because ser more serotonin is produced they say that negative ions that are produced by the water by the crashing waves produces negative ions it's like a natural antidepressant for humans it increases serotonin and, and adrenaline and it allows us to um, also have a clarity of mind because we're getting more oxygen to the system and so we have more clarity more creativity and um, the, the earth thing also is that, you know allowing like taking toxins out of our body by putting your bare feet in the earth mm -hmm. so like I have to give credit to mother nature here like she's doing most of the work I think um, and then of course we have then the added element of music that connects us so deeply to our soul which again makes us not feel alone because it's like oh yeah there you are like there's my soul and just honoring your soul wherever it's at makes you feel not alone like when someone's but when you're when someone's going through something hard like mostly what they want to hear is like I hear you like and you're not alone I'm here with you so you want to do that for yourself. You want to learn how to do that for yourself. And I find that beach dancing is a way to learn how to do that for yourself. Um, and then, of course, there's the element of dancing together. And when we dance together in rhythm, when we mirror each other's movements, there is an, a sense of I'm not alone. <laughs> I'm really deeply connecting with another. Not just like being, you know, there, everyone's felt probably the sensation of being feeling alone in a mass group of people like you're there's people all around but you feel alone like what so alone is not you can feel alone with a lot of people so there's something and it's an internal job it's an internal job it's not just about who you're surrounded by it's how you're connecting 
it's how you're connecting to yourself and then how you're connecting to others that will will allow you to feel that sense of aloneness or not. I also recognize that you have embodied the core character of your dad in showing up consistently for people that are going through things that are difficult and you're not there to like tell them what to do or how to do it but you're just holding space you're just showing up and being with them in the dancing you're doing your own dance you're doing your own dance mm -hmm. but you're creating the framework and the structure for them to do that I'm often hard on myself as we all tend to be that I'm like I don't do enough right and thank you for acknowledging that consistency that yeah I have showed up no matter what and I would say that that's like a quality for sure my dad's his name is Boris Vishnopolsky and um, you know he he uh, right when he died, his work called me about maybe a few weeks later, and they said, you know, we want to tell you something. We're not, we're calling the employee year of the uh, employee of the year award. We're we're actually calling it the Boris Vishnopolsky Award. And um, I was so touched by that. Yeah, he just loved me so so much. When I went to his office, you know, it was it was challenging the. To go to your dad's office, and I'm the only child, you know, and his, I was, my parents were divorced, and so, and his brother had special needs, and his grand, his parents were elderly, so it was really me, like, navigating his death, and I went, I went to his office to get all his stuff, and I just saw, it was my first time in his, in his office, and I saw his wall was just filled with my poems, an email I wrote him, like, five years before that. Just like he loved me so much, so much, and um, I thank him so much for the way that he shared that with me and showed up. Because I know that a lot of people don't get that from their dads, and I know I consider myself incredibly lucky for having a father that uh, expressed his love and showed up. Mainly showed up. I would say that's really the way that he expressed his love. Uh, he showed up no matter what, for all, for no matter what's happening with him. In fact, he died because at work, basically, because he, even though he had that stomach ache, still went to work. You know, he just he just showed up, and he, <laughs> my the employers uh, tell me that they had to hire five people, five, to do his one job. They still don't know how he did it all, and. Um, yeah, he was just an incredibly hard worker and huge, compassionate heart. And, you know, I really feel like this is his legacy. I feel like this is his legacy, the way that he treated others. And that's what this is really about. It's like, how are we treating each other and how are we treating ourselves? Because we are only treating each other how we're treating ourselves. So let's learn how to be kind and compassionate to ourselves, to all parts of ourselves, the ones that are in pain, the ones that are kind of annoying, <laughs> all of them. And then can we then meet each other with that same compassion? And that's what the wave is about. We dance for ourselves, we dance for each other, and then we dance for the bigger community. We dance for our elders and we you know, give back to those that came before us. And I think in our culture we can so often just dismiss where we've come from and just focus so much on future oriented technology like innovation it's all forward thinking and it's like well let's remember where we've come from and let's give gratitude and take care of those that paved the way for us and those elders right now that are you know not being related to or not be having meaning in this world because they're not seen as valuable in this culture you know 65 retire like no there's a lot of value for every stage of life 
and especially for when you're after 65, after 85, so much value, so much wisdom. And I really saw the way that my dad respected his parents and I, I in turn would like to bring that to the world. Like let's, let's respect our elders and let's really learn from them and care for them and um, you know, no matter how challenging it can be, like continue to show up and show up as a community. hardest part about showing up is the getting there part like the thoughts about showing up but once you actually show up like if you feel like you're not in the mood to go to, to go dance for example like that's probably the best time to go um, because you can dance that resistance like that resistance has a movement that resistance has a sound that resistance needs to be expressed or otherwise it just shuts you down and then just allow, then you feel bad about yourself and it just is the cycle of isolation. But when you show up, usually it, things will shift. And I notice when I show up for something outside of myself, all of a sudden my depression lifts, things shift. I'm, I feel, even when I'm actually physically sick, I start to feel more energy and vitality in my body. It's incredible. Like when you show up for something beyond yourself and I really feel like it's because our soul is like, you're playing too small. Like when you're just thinking about all your stuff and then it's like, you're playing too small and that doesn't feel good to our big, big souls. So when you can show up for something bigger than yourself, spirit just gives you more energy. Somehow you just get more energy. And so every time that I go to the wave and if I'm not feeling so great, I've always end up feeling better always and I always end up showing up with energy no matter how I'm feeling it's just something shifts as soon as the people show up as soon as it's not about me anymore and it's about holding space for others I forget about my headache whatever it was so I just really want to offer that um, as another tool like being of service is so healing for us like go when you're not when you're feeling down go help someone else you know, go visit the senior homes with us. Like we go once a month and it's incredible. You'll see the magic of service in addition to the music and the dance and nature. Like those are really the, the elements that I'm here to, to share is, is really helpful for grief. And I think that that's a really important thing for people that are going through these difficult moments. Like you're allowed to feel joy. <laughs> you're allowed like because this person passed away doesn't mean you have to be sad all the time in honor of them mm -hmm. they would want you to be joyful like you said and I think that we need to give ourselves permission to feel it all and that joy is totally welcome and it's not you're not like a bad person for feeling joy after someone's passed yeah like so much of that Grief, to be honest, I believe is our attachment and our pain of not having that person, but I believe that they actually are freed <laughs> in a lot of ways, freed of the suffering of this plane. And so just to, you know, everyone has their own beliefs and that specific way of thinking of death has helped me.